بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم خانم ها آقایان بسیار Ladies and gentlemen I'm extremely pleased to have this opportunity to meet you uh, face to face and discuss a number of issues that preoccupy all of us at the present time As I noted last year on another similar occasion, I always uh, enjoy interaction with members of the think tank community as I myself spent a good number of years working in and leading a think tank, one of the most important and preeminent ones in Iran. I believe that more interaction at this level between Iranian and American think tanks and their exchanges with officials of both countries would help in the decrease of mistrust and prevent suspicion, dispel miscalculations and foster more concrete understandings among the people and leaders of our two countries thus creating a solid foundation for the improvement of ties creating such a foundation and moving towards a better understanding is especially important in the light of ever increasing complexities and difficulties in our in our region in the Middle East in the totality of the Middle East under such circumstances and despite our people's genuine grievances about past US policies I am convinced that we need to look ahead towards the future now more than ever we need to learn and draw lessons from the past but not be held hostage to it on this basis more than at any time before we need to bring an end to artificially and non-necessary crises in order to open new horizons in co mutual cooperation and collaboration in overcoming mutual challenges that are threatening all of us the people of Iran with the choice of prudence, the government of prudence and hope in last year's presidential elections, with a great deal of their votes, gave me a mandate to follow the path of constructive engagement in foreign policy. Based on that, during the first year of my presidency, my work in foreign policy was based on the assumption that only through exchanges and active engagement between nations can challenges be turned into opportunities and the work was started based on this assumption based on understanding based on constructive understanding with foreign countries based on which we brought to bear all of our efforts on mutual trust building measures with our neighboring countries and other players in the region as well as at the international level in result of that presently we are facing less tensions in foreign policy because this policy does not need the injection of any new crises particularly those between the United States and America we based everything towards an outlook to the future towards a positive outlook so we must be able to overcome demeaning uh, arguments and conflicts and without succumbing to pressure of various pressure groups and interest in the various countries 
we must try to lead them and convince them. And also vis-a-vis -vis other pressure groups in America and the region whose objective is the perpetuity of crises, we must confront such groups. And on this path, it is necessary for illegal sanctions and inhumane sanctions that have been imposed on Iran must be done away with. And the government of the United States must, must altogether let go of pressuring policies towards Iran. In such a framework, we have been able to take serious and constructive steps in communication about the true peaceful nature and civilian nature of Iran's nuclear issue. Serious talks, hard work during these talks, accompanied with goodwill with the 5 plus 1 membership groups, gave us the occasion and the opportunity to decrease the, a great deal of the misunderstandings that existed within the framework of Iran's nuclear program, and we brought those to an end. And the agreement that was signed in Geneva in November of 2013, both because of its content and parameters, as well as the creation of a constructive, constructive atmosphere, was absolutely necessary. But for Iran, more, importantly, the, more important than the content of that joint plan of action, it was important for us to substitute dialogue and talk instead of estrangement and continued conflict and tension. With this agreement and the exec precise execution of it by the government of Iran under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, we have lived up to our commitments in order for the needed trust-building measures to be realized, and we lived up to all of our commitments. The precise measures implemented by us during the past year were geared towards showing the serious and firm commitment at the highest levels, meaning that under no conditions we will try to build, stockpile, or use any type of nuclear weapons. In practice, we have shown that political will and the needed preparedness are there on our side in order to eliminate any doubts, particularly to show transparency in our nuclear program and close the file and the issue once and for all and remove it from our mutual paths. Therefore, we do need a long-term agreement, a whole agreement, which is in need of, the, of our counterparts showing goodwill and strong political will so as to be able to take advantage of this historic and unique opportunity that the people of Iran created through their votes at the ballot boxes last year. This opportunity is not to be lost. On this path, an agreement, a final whole agreement, can manage and give the needed confidence of the true nature, true peaceful and civilian nature of Iran's nuclear program while maintaining the unalienable rights of the Iranians' use of such a domestically created program within the framework of the IAEA. Therefore, something that we would like to reiterate more than anything is the necessity of the execution without any prejudices within the framework of international laws, the realization of Iran's rights. Ladies and gentlemen, it is needed on an urgent basis to leave behind insignificant issues and to be able to focus on real and serious common challenges which require common solutions that threaten all of us, and we need common solutions to overcome these challenges, violence and extremism, unfortunately, which are on the rise in our region. 
and threaten the entirety of the world must currently be prioritized in our agendas. However, it is obvious that any successful and effective fight against extremism at the present time is contingent upon drawing lessons from past experiences. It is a fact that throughout history, the industrial nations, despite the extrovert and balanced approach in the field of trade, investment and technology, adopted an introvert and one-sided approach in general and set up and set out to deal with outside threats by short-sightedly resorting to two main tools of economic sanctions and military interventions. Regardless of its long-term consequences and effects, the terrorist attacks of September 11th of 2001 and July of 2005 showed that security, in fact, is the threat to security is an international phenomenon. And while we cannot in another country witness lack of security and instability in which the people of that nation are facing numerous problems, we cannot at that cost create security for our own countries. On the other hand, the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the political movements in the Middle East in the past few years demonstrated that security for the West could not be achieved in a stable and solid way on the basis of lending support to dictators in the Middle East. The interests of Western countries in our region are closely intertwined to the recognition of beliefs and the desires of the people of democratic governance in the region. Our region expects that the Western world would once again and for all, once and for all, place itself in the company of those true seekers of democracy and hence soften the bitter memories of its support for dictators. Currently in Western countries, voices can be heard suggesting that since political movements in the Middle East seem to have no clear prospect, the same old security-oriented order of client dictatorships must be reimposed. It is difficult to understand this and to understand why Western countries do not learn any lessons from such past experiences. The only path toward long-term stability in the region, which also entails the interests of the entire world, is the recognition of all of the diversity among its people, among the people of the region. The Western governments should accept the fact that the Islamic currents are a part of our regions, that the moderate Islamic currents are the part of our region and cannot be excluded through repressive means. As historic experiences have amply demonstrated, the more repressive means are applied, the more extreme reactions will be gotten in return. These currents should be recognized so that they could play a role a certain role within the framework of a democratic system and be encouraged to move towards moderation and lawful activities. The Western governments are ethically duty-bound to respect human rights and democratic values when they work towards maintaining security and stability in the region cooperation at the global level cooperation at the global level for the maintenance of security must go hand in hand with similar collaborative efforts with a view on advancing human ideals including the right to self-determination the right to benefit from available means at the global level in order to obtain development and the right to choose one's style of, of living. 
I am pleased that the leaders of the world concur that threats emanating from extremism are global threats. However, bombing and airstrikes are not the appropriate way to deal with this phenomenon. Military intervention in the occupation of foreign lands, even though justified in the name of repressing tyrannical regimes and advancing democracy, lead inevitably to the eruption of ethnic and religious discords, discords due to atrocities, vacuum of power and the lack of domestic structures. As from outside becomes as warfare becomes a situation, violence and bloodshed, the pattern of military solution from outside becomes a natural pattern for resolving these disputes from within as well, leading to what we are witnessing today. We should always remember that extra-regional intervention provide justification for terrorist acts and lead to more extremism. and in fact only feeds and strengthens terrorism. Growing terrorist acts in the name of religion in our region, the increase in political clash between moderate Islamic groups and secular forces, standoffs between diplomatic forces in the Islamic world and the increase in disputes within the societies have turned our time into a special time. On the, on the other hand, growing violent extremism has resulted in increasing serious concerns that have become security concerns at the global level. If the Islamic Republic of Iran could reach a comprehensive agreement on its nuclear program and leave sanctions behind, it will be able to assume a more active role in the process of intra-regional dialogue in the Islamic world. This intra-regional dialogue is a precondition for the success of the altruistic efforts in order to achieve understanding, coexistence and tolerance at the regional level. We must display a pattern of constructive dialogue and cooperation begets and cooperation competition in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, the so called Daesh or ISIL, which is nothing more than a terrorist group, typifies a violent extremism nowadays. It is born out of the aforesaid context and nurtured by the chaos which followed the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan and fed on the assistance it received from within and outside the region throughout the past decade. This group is now at work to win by reigning terror and spreading fear throughout Middle Eastern societies and beyond. In this time of strife, there is a great need for action, but how this groups came into being and how they developed must inform our path forward. Daesh's predecessors were created in the security vacuum during the years of the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan and benefited from the help of those who have sought to destabilize the demo newborn democracies there. It did not exist. These groups did not exist prior to the attack on Iraq in 2003. And with all probability, without the, such attacks and invasions, perhaps they would have never come into creation. 
the growth with addition of personnel, new recruits, financial means, equipping and training at the hands of countries in the region was became the tool so that they could change the governance, the system of governance in Syria and install a group of their choosing. Unfortunately, some have used these groups in order to spread their influence and guarantee the success of their agendas in the region. My intent here is not to assign blame or to rehash history. I only seek to show that the imposition of one's will on societies and other nations with the use of violent and extremist methods is not possible, is not successful, nor is it useful, even though it may yield the desired results on the, over the short term, over the long term it will only create tragedies. Those who have planted the seeds of violence have really stepped on the rights of nations and the people of nations, and they have, through intertwined political justifications and religious justifications, they are certainly not worthy of any sort of political leadership needed to resolve conflicts, whereas the results of the activities of Daesh have emanated from the misunderstandings of the realities of the region by the outsiders, as well as those living in the region. These do not need to become weak points of others. I invite countries from inside the region as well as throughout the world that in order to take part in combating Daesh, they might unite with the people of Iraq and the people of Syria. But I call your attention to the following. Progress on this path can only lead to success when the people of Iraq and the people of Syria can be on the same front with them, can be united with them, and the international community then supports them. It is only them, the people of Iraq and Syria, and the afflicted areas in the region that can successfully overcome uh, and eliminate uh, these threats and challenges. Of course, they also must carry the burden of leadership, and with close cooperation, we must keep providing steadfast support. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to realize that phenomena such as Daesh will not be eradicated only through military operations. In our opinion, any successful campaign against them in order to eradicate extremism in our region can only succeed with focus and attention on the points that I will include in, the, in this uh, conversation with you. One of them is fully complying with international law and the provision of the UN Charter in dealing with terrorism. Secondly, helping and enabling the relevant central authorities to lead the fight against this menace. This also include helping strengthening in, in strengthening Iraq's national unity, territorial integrity, and its all-inclusive government. Getting all the regional and international actors to discontinue military, financial, as well as logistical support for Daesh and other extremist groups active in the region. Mobilization of all regional states and resources to assist the Iraqi and Syrian people in fighting this war against extremism and terrorism, of course, with the assistance of the international community. Trying to peacefully settle crises in Syria through a political solution and avoiding the repetition of previous mistakes, ensuring consistency in the fight against Daesh wherever it may be present and whomever it may threaten, and avoiding differentiation between segments of population in terms of protection as it was the case in the past three months.
also, last but not least, putting an end to the Israeli occupation of Arab lands and denying it the impunity for war crimes against the Palestinians as it was the case recently and as inaction in the face of cases similar to the recent war crimes against the people of Gaza is a good rallying cause for extremist groups. Finally, the Islamic Republic of Iran is the only country in the region that does have the capabilities and did unconditionally assist the government of Iraq and is ready to render that aid and assistance who are afflicted by the bitter phenomenon known as Daesh. We, during the very first phases of this new phenomenon, this new challenge, we immediately sprung into action. One of them was to rise in defense of Erbil and freeing the Amerli region from the threats of Daesh prior to the intervention of anyone else or anyone else's forces in the region, even prior to them making a decision to intervene in any way, shape or form, we made available our military advisors on the front lines to our Iraqi and Kurd neighbors. So we are steadfast and we are ready to continue aiding the central authorities in those countries that have become the targets of such threats. Tomorrow during my, key, uh, my uh, speech at the United Nations General Assembly, I will remind folks that during the past year, within that same uh, General Assembly, I did give a strong warning in the face of violence and extremism. This year I will repeat myself. If the appropriate behavior is not chosen if the appropriate formula is not chosen and executed, we will continue to see an ever-increasing violent and extremist region which will threaten the entire world. The appropriate formula to combat such a phenomenon <clears throat> does not lie from outside the region, but lies within the creativity and collaboration of inter as well as intra-regional forces with the support of the international community. I do thank you. Thank you for joining us, Mr. President. I was wondering if you heard or read President Obama's speech to the General Assembly because it is a call against extremism and it sounded a lot like some of the things you have been saying. Do you think you, the two of you are on the same... Um, the same wavelength, as they say? Well, in any fashion, uh, today the topic of extremism and violence is a topic that must receive mutual assistance in, er in the eradication of it, uh, because everyone is equally threatened. And I do think that all of the leaders of the international community agree on this, that one cannot, in the face of threats and extremism, uh, remain silent. Uh, we must all take actions so that this regional threat and this international threat can be eradicated. Uh, perhaps there are differences of opinion in the, uh, in the formula that is required to be applied here. But in the essence, the core of the issue, which is the fact that a grave threat endangers all of us today, uh, and we must take effective steps to combat it, I do believe that there is uh, a great uh, deal of understanding and mutual understanding. believe that the United States is correct in its strategy to fight ISIS? I uh, am not aware of the American plans uh, and the formulas and what they intend to execute. I can only tell you about the plans of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran, from the very first moment, did not hesitate uh, in fighting against terrorism. Other countries apparently had their doubts for quite some time. Uh, they were under the impression that... Uh, um, be it as it may, they acted quite late in the game. Uh, from the first day when Daesh attacked Mosul, 
and uh, Mr. Maliki contacted me, former Prime Minister Maliki contacted me and uh, informed me of the grave situation in Iraq, I did tell him that whatever aid and assistance you see necessary and you need, we will render that assistance and aid to you so as to help you to stand up against this tide. Uh, if immediate, if it wasn't for the immediate and uh, wholehearted help of the people of Iran to the people of Iraq, and if it were not for the fatwas issued by the religious authorities in Iraq, have no doubts that Daesh today would be residing in southern Baghdad, not in the northern territory of that country. Uh, therefore, we do believe that we did live up to our responsibilities and we will continue to do so steadfastly. And others who have decided to act as well. And if those actions can lead to the eradication of terrorism, we welcome those actions. So, but we cannot have them announce this as a terrorist group, therefore a bad entity, but in order to eradicate them, help in the creation of a new terrorist group. Uh, then, after a while, of course, there will be regrets from their side, and then we'll be back to square one again. When you say that you don't want the United States to fight ISIS, but in the fighting of it to create another terrorist group, what group are you thinking of? What, what is the danger here, just so we understand? The American authorities they, themselves, they have announced that they wish to train another terrorist group, equip that uh, group, and send them to Syria to fight. You can call it whatever you wish, sir. Be that as it may, it is a group, it is another group that, as they have announced, I'm not sure what their plan is. Uh, they say we wish to train these folks in another country, military training, and they even announced the time frame. We'll train them for one year and we'll get them ready to enter Syria's territory and fight. With whose permission? With, who, with whose authority? With what mandate? According to what international laws and norms are they doing this? Uh, can a country form its own coalition with a handful of other countries and make decisions for a region or a country within that region? I do believe that uh, we must um, put the burden with a great deal of assistance, of course, on the shoulder of the Syrian people and let them make the decisions, not to make the decision for them and then announce it to them. Iran was very helpful in um, persuading, shall we say, Prime Minister Maliki to, uh, to step down and for the creation of a new uh, Iraqi government. Do you believe that enough has been done in Iraq to include the Sunnis? Because the reports are the Sunni tribes have still not uh, gotten involved. They are still waiting and they, are still, uh, they still are distrustful of what they see as a Shia government, a Shiite government in Baghdad. Um, I really don't know where you receive your interpretations from, on whose behalf, but I do firmly believe that what is important today in Iraq is that the government, uh, the administration of that country, the president is a Sunni Muslim and is a Kurd as well, ethnic Kurd, the prime minister is Shiite and Arab, ethnic Arab. The cabinet is composed of Kurds, Sunnis, and Shiites. Uh, uh, the speaker of the parliament is a Sunni Arab. The representatives of the Iraqi parliament, some are Shiites, some are Sunni, some are Kurds. Uh, we believe firmly that a united and stable and peaceful Iraq can only be realized and sustained only if everyone plays their role. Both Shiites, uh, which make up the majority of the population, as well as Sunni Arabs, which are the minority, as well as Sunni ethnic Kurds, which are another minority, all of them might, uh, must, next to one another, hand in hand, 
manage the affairs and the governance of their country. What is evident today and what we seek today in Iraq is that we wish to witness a national unity in Iraq and I do think that that's a correct path to embark upon and to stay on. I do think there is a good makeup, good balance within both the uh, government, the cabinet, as well as the legislative body. And I do think that the decision making in the appointment of the cabinet members has followed the same formula. With regard to Syria, you have said some things that I found uh, interesting, intriguing. Uh, you've talked about how after ISIS is defeated, Iran has always wanted a political settlement in which there were elections, where perhaps there would be a, uh, some kind of power sharing. Give us your, your understanding. What is your uh, vision for what might happen in Syria politically? Because there is clearly a lot of opposition to President Assad, and there will have to be some kind of um, new arrangement politically made. Certainly, the future of Syria is in the, resides within the will of the people of Syria. Syria did witness an election, at least in the cities where the needed security parameters existed, as well as those who were driven from their homes and were able to reach the ballot boxes they also participated in these elections. It was an important step. Uh, some people may deny it and try to strip it of its importance, but an election did take place in that country. In Syria, since they won. Free and fair? I mean, you have elections in Iran. Was it an election that was free and fair? I'm not here to pass judgment on that, sir. I uh, cannot pass judgment on elections in another countries, but apparently we also did have uh, certain monitors from the Islamic uh, representative uh, uh, from the Islamic Republic's parliament, as well as uh, monitors from other countries. I welcome you to refer your question to those monitors from Iran and other countries in the region to tell you about the quality and the transparency of the election. But the information that we received from our envoys uh, showed that this election respected the parameters set forth for it. And I, I'm not here to pass judgment on these elections, nor compare the Syrian elections to another electoral system. But what I'm trying to say fundamentally is that in Syria, during these three years, who were the elements which fought against the central government, this legitimate army of the Syrian government, and destroyed the country, brought it to ruins. Was there a great group that was created, known today as Daesh or ISIS or ISIL, to reach that objective? How come was it that they weren't so active in Iraq so many uh, the last three years, but now that they've reached the Iraqi territories, now they've become uh, imminent dangers? What if this Daesh cuts the heads and executes a minority sect. They become a bad group. But if they execute another minority, then they become an increasingly bad group. And then when they target those who, to whom we're most sensitive, they, they become the really, really bad and dangerous guys. So let's stop making, uh, passing these uh, judgments whether the ones whose rights were trampled upon and lives were taken are Sunnis, Kurds, Shiites, Western citizens, Iraqi citizens, it doesn't matter for us. They're all human beings. At any time, anywhere where innocence is killed, uh, the rights are trampled upon, we must condemn those actions. And terrorism and violence against any person with any ideology, any faith, any religion, any ethnic background, is condemnable within our view it is to be strongly condemned but my question is will you support a political process in syria 
uh, that could lead to a reduction in powers or a transfer of power from the Assad family and from this uh, somewhat narrow regime that has clearly a large opposition to it, as is been evident from the events that have happened over the last few years. Well, you see, sir, in Syria, we were following certain objectives, which we continue to follow. In Syria, terrorism in the form that has killed indiscriminately innocent civilians. We deeply believe that terrorism in general, particularly this brand of terrorism, can never be supported under any justification or for any aim. This very Daesh or ISIS and ISIL group who were in Syria during the last three years, who was financially supporting them, who was equipping them, who was training them. Many of these folks were arrested. They were put on trial. They confessed on television. They told everyone openly and transparently and clearly where they received their funding from, where they received their weapons from, where they received their training from. So step one, no one is justified in helping terrorists. Whether they're taking action in Syria or in Iraq or in Lebanon, it really doesn't matter. They can be wherever they, uh, they want to be, but wherever they practice extremism and their brand of terror and bloodshed against a civilian population, this cannot be tolerated. But most importantly, terrorism must be eradicated, driven out and eradicated from the region. These terrorists, you know, their makeup is quite varied. Um, they've come from Afghanistan, North Africa, the Central Asian countries, uh, European countries, North America. So they've congregated from many different countries. But our commitment must be to driving out and eradicating these terrorists. Uh, but when we speak about Syrian territorial integrity, we are firmly committed to it remaining the way it is. A disintegration of Syria or Iraq or any country in the region is extremely dangerous for the future of the region and for stability in our region. We said that many years ago. We keep repeating it today. Who rules and who doesn't rule? Who holds and who doesn't hold power? I talked about it earlier. Elections were held. The candidates were not there to choose. They were there to be chosen or not chosen. So in any country, based on what do we determine and vote for the future leadership? Uh, you were first speaking of legitimacy uh, or lack thereof. Uh, whether it is legitimate or accepted or not, or tolerated or not, who are the ones who determine these categories that that central authority fits into? If it's the judgment of the people of that country, they're free to do so, and their wish has legitimacy. But does anyone from the outside have the right to pass that such a judgment? And if so, to what degree is that judgment to be trusted and validated? speech uh, today, President Obama had a direct message to Iran. He said, don't let this moment pass. We can reach a solution. Is he right? Is the United States negotiating in good faith? Well, you see, today we have... Uh we are faced with a very good opportunity vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear talks and negotiations. This uh, good opportunity was created in reality only last year in result of uh, the expression of the political will of the majority of the people of Iran and their vast uh, uh, participation in those elections and the mandates received out of those elections. A new atmosphere was created in result of all of that. Uh, we must all make good use of it, our side as well as five plus one. Uh, everyone together must make good use of this historic opportunity. You see, the agreement reached known as JP, Joint Plan of Actions, JPOA, in Geneva, it m meant 
it signified that all of us use the opportunities properly and justly and thoroughly in order to reach the JPOA to begin with, even though it was a short, uh, brief timed agreement. Some in Iran may have been against it in the United States, some may have been against it, may currently still be against it, but altogether in the totality of it we can pass judgment that the JPOA has given more stability to the situation to both nations, the conflict decreased, the tension decreased, no more normalization of trade relations and economic relations with other country between other countries and Iran have been witnessed and then we reached about we were about to reach a deadline and we extended that deadline as contained within the initial JPOA. We still have two months ahead of us. We and when I say we I mean every side, us as well as the five plus one. We must all take the most and the best advantage of this opportunity. The topic shouldn't be whether America, Iran, or the other countries. All of the countries that can play a role, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency, everyone must help and assist so that an issue that has arisen out of various actions and practices of the West in the past few years and hasn't benefited anyone and it has hurt a multitude of sides. Results of those actions were illegal, inhumane. All of us must bring our utmost efforts to bear in order to reach the final agreement. Mr. President, on the basis of my reporting, my understanding is that Iran has offered to, to go down to 9,400 centrifuges. The United States wants you to go to 1,500 centrifuges. Why don't we split the difference? 5,500, are you willing? Shall we, shall we announce to the world that that is the midpoint? Well, we have a saying in Farsi, we say in the middle of the conflict, do not start setting rates. It's premature. The numbers you've announced, with all due respect, are not precise nor correct. Uh, they serve more of a publicity uh, purpose. I think you're representing CNN when you're speaking about these numbers and data, not on behalf of all of the experts that are gathered here today. That's not the point, sir. Uh, the point is the following. Iran is no different than any other country. All of the ones who are signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty have equal rights under that treaty. And Iran has only for seeking uh, to reach peaceful uh, aims of peaceful nuclear energy, civilian purposes only, it has equal rights as every other signatory. Nowhere in the NPT or within the, the IAEA is it dictated the number of centrifuges that a domestically generated nuclear program can have or be limited to. Let's remember that in the Geneva Agreement it was clearly stated that the enrichment program of Iran will be based on Iran's civilian nuclear energy requirements and need. Based on its own need it will build domestically centrifuges, connect them for them to start spinning. The needs are not announced by a single authority. They're announced and calculated by the legislative body, by the executive body. They have determined that in the future, Iran must have 20,000 megawatt power potential. So again, the basis is the need. The need dictates it. It doesn't mean that if I like a number or the counterpart likes a number that we can reach an agreement somewhere in the middle. You said something in a, converse, in a conversation you had with a group of journalists a couple of days ago, which intrigued me, uh, and I was lucky enough to be at that meeting. You said that in your phone call with President Obama last year, you had talked with him about potentially um, cooperating or, uh, on a number of issues, but you said all that waits for the nuclear issue to be resolved. Can you give us a sense, paint for us a picture of what what life would look like between Iran and the United States if the nuclear deal was resolved? 
Yes, during last year's telephone conversation, we did speak of extended co potential extended potential cooperation between Iran and the United States. President Obama was of the opinion that we can indeed collaborate uh, and cooperate in various fields. And I told him that I agree with you wholeheartedly that in the future we must cooperate with one another. Uh, we do have a saying in Farsi that is roughly translated as the following, let's first raise the baby that we just gave birth to and then let's go on to number two. So let's not compare any scenarios. Let's first finish the path that we've embarked upon. Then there may be other issues, a multitude of issues important to both sides. We can cooperate on those. And ultimately, Mr. Obama himself announced towards the end of that telephone conversation, he agreed with me. And he announced his agreement with me that I do think this must be our immediate focus. And I said, I will instruct Dr. Zarif, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And President Obama said, I will instruct uh, former Senator, Secretary of State, now John Kerry, to follow through as immediately as possible. Therefore, the concept is that there are many potentials of cooperation in the future. But please, let's all pay attention to this point. Both the people of the United States, as well as the people of Iran, based on the trust that they have of the government of the, their counterparts, because during these past few decades there was a lot of tension, there was a certain degree of conflict, perhaps the opinions vary, perhaps the judgments vary and the memories vary. If we can succeed with one another in one or two attempts and efforts, both the opinions of the United States, its population, as well as Iranians will change. I think most importantly than reaching the final nuclear agreement, more tangible result, uh, more desired tangible result would be the positive atmosphere that will be created in result uh, or along the way to reaching the final nuclear agreement. And I think that will be permanent in the relationship between the two countries. And I do hope and pray that in the future we will all witness an increased atmosphere of flexibility and collaboration towards reaching mutual goals of both countries. For a point to one country in particular, uh, Afghanistan, where it seems to me that the United States and Iran have very similar interests. Uh, this was apparent after the fall of the Taliban, a regime that Iran did not like. Uh, Iran was very helpful, um, according to U.S. reports, at the Bonn conference, which uh, allowed Hamid Karzai and the new government to come into power. We now have a political crisis in Afghanistan and a power-sharing deal. Will Iran support that power sharing deal? And again, it feels to me like Iran's interests and the U.S. interests in Afghanistan are very similar. The security of Afghanistan um, has incredibly high value for us. You're aware yourself, and so is the public at large, that Iran has rendered consistent aid throughout the decades to Afghanistan. You are aware that millions of Afghans who were driven from their homes and lands and regions still reside in Iran, those whom in the decade of the 80s, in result of the occupation of their country, or during the subsequent uh, Inter internal clashes, many of them became refugees in Iran. There are about three million of them in Iran. Uh, so the security of Afghanistan, the stability of Afghanistan, the progress of Afghanistan is incredibly important for Iran. Uh, from the very beginning, we sought to assist in Afghanistan so as to have a solid, healthy, transparent, uh, trustworthy election. Uh, everyone knows that at the end of that election, we witnessed two conflicting reports. Uh, what we wanted to do is reach 
a peaceful conclusion. Uh, and you do know that if one side announced independently that my camp is the winner or vice versa, the other side would announce uh, unilaterally that we have seen uh, electoral fraud. Can you imagine what conditions that would have created a widening gap, an impossibly widened gap, the sole benefit of which would have gone to the Taliban and to other terrorist groups? or to benefit one candidate uh, or the other. So our efforts were solely focused on creating an understanding, a unity of purpose, a unity of objective. Uh, there were other countries that were incredibly active in assisting in these efforts, and we're happy that today we have witnessed a coalition between the two camps involved in the Afghan presidential elections. And we do hope that in the future they will behave in such a way and conduct themselves in such a way as to seek uh, what their people are worthy of. Uh, let's not forget that their constitution may also be in need of certain reforms. Uh, but let's remember that coalitions are breakable or fragile. We must all try to feed and nurture this coalition, this domestic coalition in Afghanistan. We must all work hard towards the stability, permanent stability and progress of Afghanistan. Um, you're aware that just like, not unlike Iraq, Afghanistan also has a great, a very colorful ethnic and religious makeup. There are Pashtuns, Hazaras, Tajiks, Uzbeks, and so on. And all of these different colors of the portrait that makes up the country of Afghanistan must be active, must have equal rights and participation in the affairs of their land and country. So the support of Afghanistan is needed and very well worth uh, for all of those on, uh, who depend on the stability and security of Afghanistan. Mr. President, you know that if President Obama brings a nuclear deal uh, to Congress, uh, it is very likely that many uh, people in Congress, his opposition, his conservative opposition, will denounce him as a traitor, as having sold out uh, American security interests. Uh, what would be your advice to him? How should he sell the deal in Washington if, it, if there is a deal? I do not wish to give any advice vis-a-vis -vis Congress to President Obama. Uh, I'm certain that they will work it out between themselves. Very unlikely that Congress will lift the, the sanctions by law that, uh, that they have enacted, and so you will have to accept presidential waivers. Is that a compromise you're willing to accept? Uh, um, sir, we have nothing to do with the domestic affairs of countries. Uh, whatever the interaction may be between the executive branch and the legislative branch in America, it is none of our business. We may have certain tensions between the executive power and the legislative body in the Islamic Republic of Iran. We cannot expect uh, to say this much of the burden of this agreement lies on the shoulders of the legislators and the remaining balance lies on the shoulder of the executives. We are here to manage. As the government, the elected government of Iran, we are here to manage the affairs of the country and to ensure that the constitution is adhered to. Our counterpart is not the U.S. Congress, is the U.S. executive branch is the administration. We will reach an agreement, God willing, if it's meant to be so, with the administration. And then Ms. President Obama's administration has to work its own problems out with its Congress. Um, you mentioned uh, the fact that, in your view, moderate Islamic impulses in the Middle East had been suppressed and repressed. Um, I take it you were referring to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and General Sisi's uh, uh, takeover of power there. Do you believe that the Egyptian government is illegitimate? I do not pass such a judgment. In Egypt, as it was, uh, an election was held, but to pass judgment vis-a-vis -vis Islamic groups 
uh, in Egypt, particularly the Akhavan al Muslimin or the Muslim Brotherhood, our viewpoint is certainly different than their own view of uh, that same group. You do know that the current uh, Egyptian government has labeled the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. We do not believe that. You do know that Akhavan Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, has been a political group for many decades and has many followers in Egypt, has been very active in the political arena in Egypt. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have very um, deep relations, uh, diplomatic relations with Egypt. Uh, but if I were in the place, uh, in the shoes of uh, the current Egyptian government, I would try to attract um, the Muslim Brotherhood membership. They are a big group. They have many loyal followers. Perhaps there are differences uh, in political opinion, in political philosophy or doctrine between the Muslim Brotherhood and the current government of Egypt. But we must all strive and work hard so that every single Egyptian citizen can participate and feels compelled to participate in the elections in the future, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now. Perhaps another group will gain the upper hand in the next elections. What is important is for the atmosphere that dominates Egypt is to be a democratic atmosphere and an inclusive atmosphere so that they can all reach their mutual goals. Mr. President, let me ask you about uh, something that uh, has to do with the image of Iran uh, in the world, in America, but also among younger Iranians. And it makes it difficult for people to uh, perhaps to trust uh, Iran or to feel, you know, you were talking about the atmosphere getting better. This is, I think, the kind of thing that makes the atmosphere difficult to improve. You had six Iranians, young Iranians, who made this video of the song Happy. They have been sentenced. They have been sentenced to lashes, which have been commuted. They have been forced to recant on television. Why, why make them go through this, this punishment for making a harmless video about a song? We do have a multitude of problems sir, um, in the region and the world at large today uh, than to uh, speak about the prosecution of certain individuals. But be that as it may, I as the president of Iran have been sworn and put there by the will of the people to protect the constitution. Uh, if the Constitution is ever violated, it is my legal responsibility to take the appropriate steps and implement appropriate actions. But as you know, in Iran, we do have an independent judiciary. Uh, perhaps an individual does something that legally may not be allowed in Iran, whether I like it or you like it or not. Uh, so I am not certain what this uh, thing that you're referring to was how many people danced uh, and because of that what happened happened I don't think the problems are such in Iran that if a group wants to have fun somewhere they are then arrested or become targets I don't know the specifics of the case you're referring to but perhaps in a country a certain in any country a certain individual can be detained or questioned or put on trial if it is done so if this is done within a legal framework and if that individual has broken the law then uh, they must be uh, prosecuted through the legal channels properly if they haven't broken the law then it is a mute point you haven't seen the video it's completely harmless Let me ask you about something in my ear. Is that? Let me ask you about um, the the political situation within Iran. You again a couple of days ago you alluded to the fact that you too might face opposition if a nuclear deal were to were to be proposed. 
how would you how do you plan to deal with your domestic opposition you are not going to give president obama advice but you must have a strategy for your own situation Well, perhaps we have planned, uh, planned different things. Uh, uh, when it comes to inside of Iran, there are a multitude of groups who have formed their own opinions, and vis-à-vis -vis the nuclear issue, they formed their own opinions, they announced those opinions transparently. We have no issue with any group uh, standing up in, uh, in protest of, of a decision or other and have a conflict of opinion, have a difference of opinion, excuse me. Uh, every branch has its own prerogative uh, given under the Constitution, and every branch would adhe will adhere to its own responsibility as dictated in the Constitution. Political groups, um, parties in Iran can announce and express their opinions agree with an agreement or disagree with an agreement. We have no problems with that. Um, just as uh, revisiting the joint plan of action, a short-term agreement, uh, we were able to manage political opposition inside, talk to them, convince them, bring them more and more to our side. Mr. Obama was able to do the same here domestically in the United States. There are conflicts of uh, differences of opinion. We can always reach an accommodation. We must not all move in unison and, and, and have a one-sided opinion uh, in a country. We can all have differing opinions and reach the same objective, which is mutual benefit. Mr. President, I have one last question, and um, it's one I've asked you before, but please indulge me. Uh, Jason Rezaian, the correspondent for The Washington Post, and his wife have both been arrested. Uh, nobody knows what the charges are, nobody knows why. Your own foreign minister has said that Jason is a good reporter. Um, people have, have attested to you personally that he is a decent person. I know you say it's with the judiciary and you can't comment. My question is, I'm trying to get at this a different way. Can you give us hope that this case will be dealt with fairly, uh, with leniency, and speedily, that, he, that, that this will be resolved quickly and that Jason will be able to, to come back to the United States. In fact, uh, you're right. I do remember. I, you did answer and I did respond to this question in the previous meeting that we all had. An individual, and my response is the same, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, an individual can be detained, questioned, uh, be a security threat or not a security threat. Uh, the individual whom you named is uh, being investigated, is in detention, being investigated. During this period of time, anything, a multitude of things can change. Today, the individual, when questioned, can give a response, tomorrow give another type of a response. But all of those who are familiar with the legal process um, know that at a time when a file, uh, when a case, excuse me, is being uh, built and the prosecutor or uh, the prosecutor is working hard to send that case file to the appropriate court, only then will everyone be informed as to what the actual charges are. And perhaps at that time, the judge of that court will not agree with the judiciary's charges. So, listen, leniency and everything that you just went over, uh, these are topics to be thought about or spoken of after the final judgment is rendered. And again, going back to the issue of citizenship, perhaps, yes, they may have dual citizenship, but you do know full well that we do not accept dual citizenships. We see them as Iranians, first and foremost and only. And any individual who is brought up on any charges or detained or questioned, all of the different steps must be in accordance to the constitutions and the laws of the country. If that individual has not committed any crimes, it will be determined 
that he or she or they are innocent and they will be freed and it will be announced openly. So we must not prematurely express opinions about a case file that hasn't reached the court yet. Uh, sometimes the uh, minister uh, for the judici judicial affairs sometimes does inquire, a member of my cabinet sometimes does inquire as to the conditions of folks who are detained from time to time. And based on this general process, we can express an opinion from time to time. We can have expectations of receiving responses to our inquiries. But I do hope, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the individual uh, individuals that you named, if they have not committed any crimes, for them to be found innocent. And if they have committed any crimes, for the punishment to be fair and according to the Constitution as well. From your office about their condition, it would, I think it would carry some weight. Generally speaking, for everyone, uh, what I said goes for everyone, not targeted towards a certain case file or a certain individual. It's my full hope and expectation that he will be released soon. Mr. President, thank you so much. Thank you, sir.